number of years ago, Ann and I moved into a new home. And we were pleased to discover that the previous owners of that house had left a beautiful plant, a hanging plant, on the back deck of the house. Now, Ann and I are admittedly not good with plants. We love plants. We love flowers. Our history with the care of plants is pathetic. (laughs) So we were determined in this new home that we were going to diligently tend this beautiful plant that had been left for us. We watered that plant conscientiously through the summer and into early fall. And the plant thrived. I was so pleased. In fact, in the early fall, that plant continued to hold its color and look terrific. However, curiously, at the end of October, I noticed that this beautiful plant continued to have colorful blossoms. Now, for even a non-botanist like me, It hit me as odd that the blossoms were colorful late into October and an alarming possibility crossed my mind. Could it be that that plant is artificial? (laughs) Hesitantly, I suggested the possibility to Anne. So Anne soberly stepped onto the back deck to look more closely. And when she came back into the house, her hand was over her mouth. And she had this just forlorn expression on her face. And she reported to me that the plant was indeed artificial. (laughs) Anne and I are pathetic (laughs) when it comes to plants. We'd been carefully tending a plant that wasn't real. And here's why I share that story. What we were really doing is watering an illusion, right? Right? We were watering an illusion. We were so captivated with outward appearance, we never bothered to pay attention to the reality that the plant itself was not alive. Friends, I think that can happen in spiritual life. People can be so preoccupied with looking good outwardly that they never pay attention to the real condition of their heart inwardly. It seems that that happened to a guy in a parable that Jesus told. He was the older of two sons in a rather shocking story that Jesus presented. The story is referred to as the parable of the prodigal son. This older son in the story was evidently so preoccupied with looking good outwardly that he failed to recognize how relationally disconnected he had become inwardly from the father who loved him. In a sense... He was watering an illusion. If you have a Bible with you, you could turn with me to Luke 15. Luke 15, and uh, if you have a Bible app on your phone, go there right now. Um, Just be sure to turn the ringer down. In Luke 15, we have a trilogy of stories that Jesus told. There was a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. This is what we read beginning at verse, at verse 25 of Luke 15. By the way, this is really the story of two lost sons. Beginning at verse 25. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother, that younger brother, has come, come home, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he's received him back safe and sound. 
But he, the older brother, was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I've served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who's devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he, the father, said to him, Son, you're always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. This story is commonly known, referred to as the parable of the prodigal son. But as we saw last week, there really are two sons in this story. In fact, the story opens in verse 11. There was a man who had two sons. There was a man who had two sons. Jesus didn't tell this story in a vacuum either. There was a first century audience that heard this story when Jesus first presented it. They were around him. And who was in that audience around Jesus? We're told in verses 1 to 2 of Luke 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now this is really significant for understanding the impact of this story that Jesus was telling. There were two groups around Jesus, tax collectors and sinners. And by the way, when the term sinners there is used, it's not in any way inferring that uh, some are sinners and some are not. It's not that some people uh, uh, have violated God's holiness and others have not. This reference to sinners relates to flagrant, public, out in the open, disregard for God. And then there were the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Now this is important because the two sons in the story represent these two groups of people who were around Jesus when he told the story. Tax collectors and sinners represented the younger son, who we looked at last week in Act 1. Pharisees and teachers of the law represented the older son, who we're going to look at today in Act 2. So there are these two groups, both of whom, now this is what's important, friends, both of whom were in some way relationally disconnected from God. Last week, when we looked at the younger son, we, uh, we asserted that the question Jesus was really raising for that group is, what is God like? Because he clashed with the Pharisees. They had a very different vision of God. And Jesus is telling this story, at least in part, to get at this question, what is God like? This father in Jesus' story ran to the repentant younger son. In Jesus' story, the younger son was not defined by his rebellion, but rather, as as we came to the end of Act 1, that story, that younger son was defined as the object of his father's redeeming love. When the younger son turned, he could now experience the love that the father was offering him that was his to enjoy. It had been his to enjoy all along, but now that he had turned toward the Father, he could enjoy it. And we said last week, God runs to love, and he loves to run. That's God. That's the God that Jesus came to show us. And as Jesus is telling his story, I imagine that the outcasts around him were amazed. I imagine there were outcasts in that audience who had tears on their faces and for the first time, for many of them, they had honest hope in their hearts. The Pharisees, on the other hand, who were in that audience were ticked. Lips 
quivering and teeth clenched, their collective blood pressure was in the danger zone. They took issue with a God like this. And Jesus then deliberately continued his story. Following Act 1 that focused on the younger son, Act 2 began. Jesus introduced a third character, the older son. We meet him in verse 25. This is what we read again in verses 25 to 27. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he's received him back safe and sound. Now, how's this older brother going to respond to this celebration, this joy of the father? This celebration and this homecoming of a lost son was perhaps the greatest day in this father's life. And so he had organized a banquet and planned a banquet, and he had invited the entire community to come. He was going to offer a delicacy in that culture at that time, a fattened calf. How's the older brother going to respond? There's music. There's dancing. Verse 28 says, the older brother became angry and refused to go in. At this point, the Pharisees listening to Jesus' story are saying, yes, yes, finally, someone in the story gets it. This older brother becomes their hero. They kind of each want their own older brother bobblehead. (laughs) They just love it when he digs in his heels and chooses to boycott the party. Then the older brother, (laughs) he addresses the father now in verse 29. (laughs) Here it comes. But he answered his father, look, these many years I've served you. I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me even a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. This older brother is seething. If you take a closer look at what he says in verse 29, you realize he's really stinked. Because he thinks the father owes him. Friends, that's what lifeless religion can do. All of life becomes a matter of duty as you relate to, uh, in our case, a God who created and who loves us and who redeemed All of life becomes mere duty. Now, there are times when we're weary or when we're um, off balance, when to respond to God, to obey Him, may involve some measure of duty. But if, if it's only duty and never delight, if it's only duty and never delight, there is reason to evaluate the quality of the relationship that we have with God. This morning, let's assert that the gospel of Jesus Christ is not a call to religion. It's a call to relationship with God. There's a difference between religion and relationship. What do I mean by that? Religion, what ultimately matters is what we do. In relationship, What ultimately matters is what God has done through Jesus Christ. Christianity features a central message that we call the gospel. And in the gospel, the good news begins with some bad news. We're told that we all have a sort of spiritual stigmatism, a curvature of the soul that the Bible calls sin. Not some of us, not most of us. All of us, we discover that we all need 
a Savior. And then the Gospel tells us that in breathtaking love, God has reached for us. God took the initiative to meet us right where we are. Jesus Christ entered history because of the awesome love of God toward us that was most poignantly displayed on a cross outside Jerusalem on the stage of history. In amazing grace, God did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He provided a sacrifice to cover our sin so that we could be reconciled to him. We access all of that by faith. God desires relationship with us. God desires relationship with you. Real, vital, meaningful, honest relationship with you. Now here's where mankind's response to God can get curious. Experience tells us that there are people who initially respond to God with a humble awareness of their need for a Savior. However, at some point along the way, almost inexplicably, they lapse back into religion, apparently supposing that they can measure up. Here's the crux of the deception for people captive to lifeless religion. People who embrace religion unwittingly suppose that they can become their own savior. Because of their sacrifice, because of their good works, because of their outward conformity to a moral code, they suppose that God owes them something, that they can be their own savior. It was an issue in the first century, and friends, can we you know, be real transparent here? That's an issue today. And I'd submit to you that lots of people are held captive to this deception. Religion says, you can be the object of God's love because of what you do. The gospel says, you can be the object of God's love because of what God has done. What he's done for you through Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. And not coincidentally, people who operate with a religion orientation have blurred vision. The result, very often, is that a posture of gratitude is conspicuously missing from those who embrace religion. They suppose that somehow God owes them. This older son in the story said, you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. Uh, time out. Wait, wait a minute. Never gave even a young goat? According to verse 12, this older brother would have had a majority share of the estate. And as the elder brother in that culture, his share was two-thirds of all of his father's property. Never even a young goat. In verse 31, the father says to the older son, all that I have is yours. And he meant all that he had belonged to that older son. Because remember earlier, early in the parable, the father had given to the younger son his share of the, the estate. Everything that was left. Everything that was left. All that the father had belonged to this older son. But an attitude of gratitude is conspicuously missing. Friends, I'd submit to you we're all vulnerable to that when we lapse into lifeless religion. God, what have you done for me lately? I 
When anyone operates before God with a you owe me orientation, mark it down, there's likely to be a lack of thanksgiving. The older brother continues this tirade. But when this son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. Now, I, I just, let me open my own heart and be transparent here. This is where the story gets really, really sobering for me and I believe for us because we're all vulnerable to this attitude of the older brother. He said, when this son of yours, it's not my brother, it's not my little brother, when this son of yours comes home, he's resenting the father being so generous with someone else. In ancient Jewish culture, when the head of the house left a family celebration, the music and the dancing and the celebration would be suspended until the host returned to the party. And we're told in the story, aren't we, that the father went outside to speak to the older son. So in this story, the the, the party slowed down, the celebration paused while the father was outside um, pleading, according to the NIV, entreating, not commanding, entreating the older son, according to the ESV, to come in and to share in the celebration. But this older son won't participate in his father's party because he's having a party himself. He's throwing for himself a pity party. Grace didn't seem fair to him, so he refuses to celebrate. Friends, listen to me this morning. Grace, by its very nature, is not fair. The gospel of Jesus tells me that God has graciously provided for me what I don't deserve. That's what's so stunning about the gospel. God has provided for me what I don't deserve. As this generous, compassionate father in the story who loved his older son so that we don't miss this, he loved his older son every bit as much as he loved his younger son. He says in verse 31, go back, son, You're always with me, and all that's mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this. Your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Friends, in this story, Jesus is revealing to us a whole lot about the heart of the Father, isn't he? As we said last week, in this parable, Jesus was speaking to the issue, what is God like? And in this story, Jesus is telling us that God is a God who loves people whether they've broken his heart through the flagrant rebellion of wild living or the less obvious rebellion of moralistic pride. It's not that he blesses either type of rebellion. He he disdains rebellion. Yet he loves the people who are currently enslaved. That's God, and that's what he's like. And curiously, the story abruptly ends to verse 32. It's just... So what happens? I mean, the father's out entreating the older son. What happens? It leaves you hanging. You don't know what the older brother decided. You don't know if he ever went inside. And friends, I believe Jesus very deliberately did that. It's as though, remember that audience around him, it's as though he looks into the eyes of the Pharisees who are in the room and he says to them, you're in this story. The older son, the older brother, is you, Pharisees and teachers of the law. How long will you insistently suppose that you can be your own savior? How long will the party wait while you decide whether or not God can express his generous love to other people? How long? How long? Tim Keller is a 
pastor and author in New York City who about uh, a decade ago wrote a book that has been incredibly helpful to me. The book is titled Prodigal God. It's a book that's all about this story. And I remember at first um, being startled by the title to the book, Prodigal God. What's he saying by that? He said, if you look up that word prodigal in Webster's Dictionary, we normally think of prodigal as meaning wayward, right? But in Webster's Dictionary, the definition is reckless spender. And who in this story of Jesus spent more recklessly than the Father here? I want you to watch just a brief clip from Tim Keller's teaching on this story. This is about the elder brother. Let's watch it right now. So there are two kinds of lostness. That's the reason Jesus put the elder brother in the parable. You can escape God as much through morality and religion as you can escape God through immorality and irreligion. There are a lot of people, there are a lot of Christians with an elder brother type of heart. If in your heart of hearts you say, I try very hard, I try to be obedient, I go to church, I pray, I try to serve Jesus. Therefore, God, you owe it to me to answer my prayers, to give me a relatively good life, and to take me to heaven when I die. If that's the language of your heart, then Jesus is your model, Jesus is your example, Jesus is your boss, but he's not your savior. You're seeking to be your own savior. And all your morality and all your religion it's all just a way to get God to give you the things you really want and they are not God himself elder brothers obey to get things from God and if those things aren't forthcoming they get very angry but gospel believing Christians obey God just to get God just to resemble him and love him and know him and delight in him. Jesus wants all of us to see ourselves in this story. From the younger brother, we learn that from ever we may have strayed, no matter how far you might feel from God this morning, it's possible somebody came in. You're in the midst of some flagrant rebellion right now. No matter how far you may feel from God, There's a way home. Jesus is the one who paid the price to secure that way home. From the older brother, we learn that God points us not to religion, but to the gospel and to real relationship and real fellowship with him, where we're not watering an illusion, trying to maintain something outwardly while ignoring whether or not what we're maintaining is real and alive. Both the brothers teach us that God longs for us to desire his heart more than his things. Jesus wants us to see ourselves in this story. There's one more critical truth to note about this parable. When the younger brother left home, there was one person in the family, in that culture, who would have been the one responsible to, uh, to launch an all-out search party. And it was not the father. It was the elder brother. The elder brother was heir to all the remaining estate, and in that culture, he was in charge of the family. He was the one who would have been expected to launch an all-out rescue operation for his younger brother. Sadly, the younger brother in this story had a Pharisee for an older brother. But friends, please listen to my heart. But we do not. 
We have a true elder brother in Jesus Christ. He didn't simply uh, he didn't simply go across land in order to find us. He came all the way from heaven to earth to reach to us where we are. He didn't uh, he didn't come with just a portion of the estate looking for us. He spent his own life at the cost of his life. He came looking for us. He's the true elder brother. And my great hope for every one of us in this room is that we would pin our hope securely on him and all that he's done for us. He is the Savior. So let's look to him. Let's pin all of our hope on him and enter in with joy to real relationship, secure relationship with the living God who is our Father. Father in heaven, I just ask that your spirit would do right now what only your spirit could do in this room. God, I pray that you would take this story that Jesus told and you'd help us to embrace it to understand it, to humble ourselves before you, and to unashamedly pursue joy that's found in Jesus Christ alone. We pray this for your glory, Father, in Christ's name. Amen.